Epidemiologist. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm Aloto Simenes Bello. I am the work for eight years of experience. I decided to take my Magister Epidemiology in Diponegori University because development country and we have many problems about the public health especially in epidemiology and the other reason we all know that epidemiology government and individuals uh, and the other I just think master epidemiology in Diponegori University because one of the mission is conducting research based in the community service and conducting research uh, in the field of the epi epidemiology that produce publication policy recommendation and intervention innovation and I believe that in Diponegori University can Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs, including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW Project 
has been implemented in two continents in Africa, known as One Health Central, and Eastern Africa as OHCEA, and in Asia, known as Southeast One Health University Network, or COHUN. The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohun, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity One Health workforce. Established in 2012, Indohun focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision, which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohun has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohun established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center, or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohun formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohun formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohun formed OHCC Airlangga University. In 2018, Indohun formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohun formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities, and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels. Instagram at Indohoon.id, Twitter at Indohoon, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Indonesia One Health University Network, website Indohoon.org. Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW Project has been implemented in two continents in Africa, known as One Health Central and Eastern Africa as OHCEA, and in Asia, known as Southeast One Health University Network, or COHUN. 
The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohoon, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity One Health workforce. Established in 2012, Indohoon focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision, which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohoon has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohoon established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center, or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohoon formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohoon formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohoon formed OHCC Airlangga University. In 2018, Indohoon formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohoon formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities, and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels, Instagram, at Indohoon.id, Twitter at Indohoon, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Indonesia One Health University Network, website Indohoon.org.
Epidemiology Master Program of Diponegoro University aims to produce epidemiologists who have expertise and experience in the field of epidemiology, so that they're able to work independently in planning and compiling alternative solutions to health problems comprehensively through the One Health approach. There are four choices of concentration. They are first, general epidemiology, second, field epidemiology, third, clinical epidemiology, and fourth, field epidemiology training program One Health. 427 epidemiologists were produced from 2001 to June 2020. The Epidemiology Master Study Program accepts online class and face-to-face -face lectures through the course and by research programs with a total of 37 to 42 credits and an average study period of three semesters, which is 1.5 years. Publication media for lecturers and students that are already available is the Epidemiology Journal of Community Health which has been accredited nationally and can be accessed in the following page. Hello everyone, I'm Narcis Musafir, I'm from Rwanda. Rwanda is a country in East Africa. Now I'm studying Master of Epidemiology in Universitas de Conegoro. I choose UNDIP because UNDIP is among the best universities in the world. And secondly, they have a good Master of Epidemiology. When I say it's a good one because they have good laboratory settings, they also have uh, uh, good lecturers, they are professional, and anything you need to do a research in only is there. So I may encourage anyone, anywhere, if you want to be successful in your career, especially in epidemiology, I want to be a good epidemiologist as me because uh, according to the experience I have in my country uh, I worked in different hospitals I worked at in, in different companies uh, health companies so uh, and even when you see the Africa continent you see there are different pandemics so I decided to choose epidemiology and study it in uh, UNDIP, Universitas de Ponegro, so that I may help my country and even my continent to fight against these pandemics, to promote the well-being of population in my country. So anyone, anywhere, come to study in UNDIP if you ha want to be a, a successful researcher, a good epidemiologist. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm Alotu Simenes Bello. I am general practitioner. I have already worked for eight years of experience. I decided to take my Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because my country is a development country and we have many problems about the public health, especially in epidemiology. And the other reason, we all know that epidemiology is 
the gold science of public health. And it's also a science and art that to prevent disease, prolong life, improve health, through organized efforts, uh, knowledge table, choices made by the community, organization, government, and individuals. Uh, and the other, I choose Master Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because one of the mission is conducting research based in the community surveys and conducting research uh, in the field of the epi epidemiology that produce publication, policy recommendation, and intervention innovation. And I believe that in Diponegoro University uh, can produce human resource with good competence, good personality, good mentality, and good uh, placement preparation. Uh, that is the reason why I chose uh, Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University. Thank you. Epidemiology Master Program of Diponegoro University aims to produce epidemiologists who have expertise and experience in the field of epidemiology, so that they are able to work independently in planning and compiling alternative solutions to health problems comprehensively through the One Health approach. There are four choices of concentration. They are first, general epidemiology, second, field epidemiology, third, clinical epidemiology, and fourth, field epidemiology training program One Health. 427 epidemiologists were produced from 2001 to June 2020. The Epidemiology Master Study Program accepts online class and face-to-face -face lectures through the course and by research programs with a total of 37 to 42 credits and an average study period of three semesters, which is 1.5 years. Publication media for lecturers and students that are already available is the Epidemiology Journal of Community Health which has been accredited nationally and can be accessed in the following page.
need to study in universities to take the course around because it's a good space and a good environment for studying. So I say others are welcome. The language will just be a barrier because you're going to learn it in a very short period of time. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Narcis Musafir, I'm from Rwanda. Rwanda is a country in East Africa. Now I'm studying Master of Epidemiology in Universitas de Conegoro. I choose UNDIP because UNDIP is among the best universities in the world. And secondly, they have a good Master of Epidemiology when I say it's a good one because they have good laboratory settings, they also have uh, uh, good lecturers, they are professional, and anything you need to do a research in only is there. So I may encourage anyone, anywhere, if you want to be successful in your career, especially in epidemiology, I want to be a good epidemiologist as me because uh, according to the experience I have in my country uh, I worked in different hospitals I worked at in, in different companies uh, health companies so uh, and even when you see the Africa continent you see there are different pandemics so I decided to choose epidemiology and study it in uh, UNDIP, Universitas de Ponegro, so that I may help my country and even my continent to fight against these pandemics, to promote the well-being of population in my country. So anyone, anywhere, come to study in UNDIP if you have, want to be a, a successful researcher, a good epidemiologist. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm Alotu Simenes Bello. I am general practitioner. I have already worked for eight years of experience. I decided to take my Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because my country is a development country and we have many problems about the public health, especially in epidemiology. And the other reason, we all know that epidemiology is the core science of public health and it's also a science and art that to prevent disease, prolong life, improve health, through organized efforts, uh, knowledge stable choices made by the community, organization, government, and individuals. Uh, and the other, I choose Master Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because one of the mission is conducting research based in the community surveys and conducting research uh, in the field of the epi epidemiology that produce publication, policy recommendation, and intervention innovation. And I believe that in Diponegoro University uh, can produce human resource with good competence, good personality, good mentality, and good uh, placement preparation. Uh, that is the reason why I chose uh, Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University. Thank you.
Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs, including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW Project has been implemented in two continents in Africa, known as One Health Central, and Eastern Africa as OHCEA, and in Asia, known as Southeast One Health University Network, or COHUN. The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohun, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity, One Health Workforce. Established in 2012, Indohun focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision, which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohun has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohun established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center, or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohun formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohun formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohun formed OHCC Airlangga University. In 2018, Indohun formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohun formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities, and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels. Instagram at indohoon.id. Twitter at indohoon. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Indonesia One Health University Network. Website indohoon.org.
hidup lagi.
Epidemiology Master Program of Diponegoro University aims to produce epidemiologists who have expertise and experience in the field of epidemiology, so that they are able to work independently in planning and compiling alternative solutions to health problems comprehensively through the One Health approach. There are four choices of concentration. They are first, general epidemiology, second, field epidemiology, third, clinical epidemiology, and fourth, field epidemiology training program one. 427 epidemiologists were produced from 2001 to June 2020. The Epidemiology Master Study Program accepts online class and face-to-face -face lectures through the course and by research programs with a total of 37 to 42 credits and an average study period of three semesters, which is 1.5 years. Publication media for lecturers and students that are already available is the Epidemiology Journal of Community Health which has been accredited nationally and can be accessed in the following page. Hello everyone, I'm Narcis Musafir, I'm from Rwanda. Rwanda is a country in East Africa. Now I'm studying Master of Epidemiology in Universitas de Conegoro. I choose UNDIP because UNDIP is among the best universities in the world. And secondly, they have a good Master of Epidemiology. When I say it's a good one because they have good laboratory settings, they also have uh, uh, good lecturers, they are professional, and anything you need to do a research in only is there. So I may encourage anyone, anywhere, if you want to be successful in your career, especially in epidemiology, I want to be a good epidemiologist as me because uh, according to the experience I have in my country uh, I worked in different hospitals I worked at in, in different companies uh, health companies so uh, and even when you see the Africa continent you see there are different pandemics so I decided to choose epidemiology and study it in uh, 
NDIP, Universitas de Ponegro, so that I may help my country and even my continent to fight against these pandemics, to promote the well-being of population in my country. So anyone, anywhere, come to study in UNDIP if you have, want to be a, a successful researcher, a good epidemiologist. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm Alotu Simenes Bello. I am general practitioner. I have already worked for eight years of experience. I decided to take my Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because my country is a development country and we have many problems about the public health, especially in epidemiology. And the other reason, we all know that epidemiology is the core science of public health and it's also a science and art that to prevent disease, prolong life, improve health, through organized efforts, uh, knowledge stable choices made by the community, organization, government and individuals. Uh, and the other, I choose Master Epidemiology in Diponegoro University because one of the mission is conducting research based in the community surveys and conducting research uh, in the field of the epi epidemiology that produce publication, policy recommendation, and intervention innovation. And I believe that in Diponegoro University uh, can produce human resource with good competence, good personality, good mentality, and good uh, placement preparation. Uh, that is the reason why I chose uh, Magister Epidemiology in Diponegoro University. Thank you. Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs, including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW Project has been implemented in two continents in Africa, known as One Health Central, and Eastern Africa as OHCEA, and in Asia, known as Southeast one Health University Network, or COHUN. The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohun, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity one Health Workforce. Established in 2012, Indohun focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohun has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohun established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center, or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 
and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohum formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohun formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohun formed OHCC Airlangga University. In 2018, Indohun formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohun formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities, and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels. Instagram at indohoon.id. Twitter at indohoon. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Indonesia One Health University Network. Website indohoon.org.
the heart of One Health or Global Health is the empowerment of the community. How they can manage themselves so that they can have a healthy life. Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs, including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW project has been implemented in two continents in Africa known as One Health Central and Eastern Africa as OHCEA and in Asia known as Southeast One Health University Network or COHUN. The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohun, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity, One Health Workforce. Established in 2012, Indohun focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision, which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohun has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohun established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohun formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohun formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohun formed OHCC Airlangga University. In 2018, Indohun formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohun formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 
3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels. Instagram at Indohoon.id. Twitter at Indohoon. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Indonesia One Health University Network. Website Indohoon.org. If you ask me, do I know the future, the next future, tomorrow? Probably not. But I know the future, the long future. Either someone else from the other country will do. If none, I will do it now. I don't want to wait until something happens. And I hope you also have that kind of dream. Remember, sometimes there is no leader in front of you because you are the one. Work together to make innovations, to develop drugs, vaccines, and others. I'd like to say when there is a problem, when there is a big problem, there is a big opportunity. Don't talk only about the problems. Find the other side of the coin. Find the solution.
heart of One Health or Global Health is empowerment of the community. How they can manage themselves so that they can have a healthy life.
Is empowerment of the community. How they can manage themselves so that they can have a healthy life.
if you ask me do i know the future the next future tomorrow probably not but i know the future the long future either someone else from the other country will do if none i will do it now i don't want to wait until something happens and i hope you also have that kind of dream remember sometimes there is no leader in front of you because you are the one work together to make innovations to develop drugs vaccines and others I'd like to say when there is a problem when there is a big problem there is a big opportunity Don't talk only about the problems find the other side of the coin find the solution Over the past several decades, many previously unknown human infectious diseases have emerged from animal reservoirs, including agents such as SARS coronavirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, avian influenza, MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and others. The increasing interconnectivity between humans, animals, and the environment has yielded into a new approach. Because of that, USAID initiated One Health Workforce Project, or known as OHW, which has three key areas. Those are multi-sectoral engagement, education and training, and institutional strengthening. Since 2014, OHW Project has been implemented in two continents in Africa, known as One Health Central, and Eastern Africa as OHCEA, and in Asia, known as Southeast One Health University Network, or COHUN. The collaboration has spread across 162 faculties and 84 universities in 12 countries. As one of the biggest archipelago countries with vast diversity, Indonesia plays an important role in global health. Indonesia One Health University Network, or known as Indohun, is the frontline and pioneer in advocating human capacity, One Health Workforce. Established in 2012, Indohun focuses on fostering One Health collaboration in Indonesia that encourages multi-professions effort to combat emerging health problems in human, animal, and the environment. Stated in National Long-Term Development Plan, RPJP, our vision aligns perfectly with Indonesia's big vision, which is community empowerment through education and training. Indohun has three main focuses, and those are education and training, multi-sectoral engagement, and institutional strengthening. Indohun established a collaborative center at the university level called One Health Collaborating Center, or known as OHCC. OHCC was formed from 2015 to 2019 and located throughout strategic areas in Indonesia. In 2015, Indohun formed the first OHCC at Gajah Mada University. In 2016, Indohun formed OHCC Udayana University. In 2017, Indohun formed OHCC Airlangga University. 
In 2018, Indohun formed OHCC Chiakwala University. And in 2019, Indohun formed OHCC Chendrawasi University. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 52 educational programs, 27 community outreach programs, and 17 research studies have been conducted by OHCC. Until now, 3,622 people have participated in OHCC activities and 24,197 people have benefited from the existence of OHCC. OHCC has also conducted various programs and collaborated with various institutions such as University of Montpelier, University of Tokyo, Hokkaido University, UNSW Australia, Nivea, Nikki Diagnostic Center, OIE, CIRAD, Gryphon Scientific, and Veterinary Domain Public-Private Partnership. What we have done is not finished yet. There are still many tasks which need to be done to improve national and global health. We understand that it is a complex challenge and impossible to be solved alone. Through coordination and strengthening collaboration across sectors, disciplines, and countries, we can tackle global health problems and challenges together. Less me, more we. Indohoon social media channels. Instagram at Indohoon.id. Twitter at Indohoon. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Indonesia One Health University Network. Website Indohoon.org.
Epidemiology Master Program of Diponegoro University aims to produce epidemiologists who have expertise and experience in the field of epidemiology, so that they're able to work independently in planning and compiling alternative solutions to health problems comprehensively through the One Health approach. There are four choices of concentration. They are first, general epidemiology, second, field epidemiology, third, clinical epidemiology, and fourth, field epidemiology training program One Health. 427 epidemiologists were produced from 2001 to June 2020. The Epidemiology Master Study Program accepts online class and face-to-face -face lectures through the course and by research programs with a total of 37 to 42 credits and an average study period of three semesters, which is 1.5 years. Publication media for lecturers and students that are already available is the Hello, Prof. Alfonso. Thank you oh. for your coming. Hello. Hello, good day for you and good night for me. <laughs> you are in the future, I'm in the past. Prof. Agus, Sukuk Iljam, Prof. Agus. Yeah, Prof. Aki, good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Professor Morales, how are you doing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, nice to see you too. Okay, can the event be started? Yeah. Mrs. Dewey? Yes. Okay. Uh, First, sorry for the late start time because of the time difference constant with the speakers. Uh, before we even start, to all participants, please attack the background of the activity that was provided by the committee. Please check in chat room for all participants. Okay, thank you. Please, the committee, share the background. Sudah? Okay. Okay, we ask the attention for all participants because the event will start soon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and best wishes for all of us. The Honorable Dean of the Graduate School of Diponegoro University, Semarang, Dr. R.B. Sularto SHM Hum. Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs for the Graduate School, Prof. Dr. Hadianto ST MSc IPU, Vice Dean of Resources and Innovation for the Graduate School, Prof. Dr. T. Ritnaninsi Suprabawati MAPPSC, Dr. Dr. Dwi Sutiningsi MKS as the Head of the Epidemiology Master's Study Program. Prof. Alfonso G. Rodriguez Morales as our speakers today from Institution Universitaris Vision del Emerich, Dr. B.H. as the moderator, lecturer, School of Postgraduate, Diponegoro University, and also in the home coordinator. So the entire academy community of Diponegoro University Graduate School and the last all visiting professor participant. Thank you. 
Sorry. Sorry. I'm coming again. Uh, welcome to visiting Professor Agenda. New challenges for controlling arto, arbovirus and other zoonotic disease organized by the Master of Epidemiology at the Graduate School of Diponegoro University. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shahila Afriana. It's a precious chance for me to be uh, your Master of Ceremony on this every uh, very special occasion. First of all, let's say that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy so we can attend and participate in this special event. Praise and salutation upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who had brought us to the part of the lake from the darkness in this light. We would like to attend a warm welcome and express our gratitude from Prof. Alfonso Gerodides Morales as our speakers today, and Prof. Dr. Agus Wandono, MPH, Dr. PH as our moderator, and all of the audience. On this special morning, we have several agenda as follows. The first is opening, the second is singing Indonesia Raya, uh, the third is opening speech from Prof. Dr. Haryanto STMSC IPU as Vice Dean of Academic and Student Affairs from the Graduate School Diponegoro University. And next, main lecture from Prof. Alfonso Morales and discussion and uh, the rest mentionment. And the last is the closing. Okay, well, Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin the event by reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The second is singing the national anthem Indonesia Raya. To the participant, let us sing the national anthem Indonesia Raya. Operator, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you for all participants. 
The next agenda is opening speech. The speech will be del delivered by Prof. Dr. Hadianto, STMSC IPU, as Vice Dean of Academic and Student Affairs for the Graduate School di Ponegoro University. For Prof. Dr. Hadianto, time is yours. Thank you, uh, MC. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear distinguished guests, uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Alfonso Rodriguez Morales, uh, head of the program of Master of Epidemiology and all lecturer at the program and also all the participants. Uh, we are glad to meet this morning for this webinar a series conducted by the uh, Master Program of Epidemiology. The seminar series is very important to gain a new knowledge uh, shared by the invited speaker. And in this event, we glad to have uh, Prof. Alfonso Rodriguez Morales uh, that comes, uh, although via uh, Zoom. And also we expect to have a new perspective uh, for the students, not only uh, our uh, school student, but also for the uh, community uh, in the field of epidemiology. Uh, the topic today is about new challenge for controlling arbovirus and other zoonotic uh, disease. And I think this topic is very relevant, especially when the COVID-19 shows uh, the trend of uh, decreasing right now. Uh, probably after this COVID-19 uh, pandemic offer, uh, there will be another uh, possibility for a new pandemic. And that will be our attention for, for coming, uh, coming years. Therefore, uh, this webinar today is very, very important uh, for us. On this occasion, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Alfonso personally, who is frequently giving as uh, the lecture, I think it's already three times uh, Prof. Alfonso already uh, presents to our school. Uh, indeed, uh, your lecture will be another beneficial to, to our school and our community. And thank you also for the uh, head of the program, Budwi, uh, who is organizing this uh, webinar, and also uh, moderator, Prof. Agus, uh, who will guiding this uh, webinar. I hope all the particip uh, participants could uh, actively enjoy and join in this uh, discussion and absorb all the message from the uh, speakers. Thank you very much. And by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I officially open this webinar. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Hadianto, STMSC APU for speech and very warm welcome. Okay, the ladies and gentlemen, from the documentation, we are going to have a photo session. Please on camera, the committee will take photo. <laughs> Tahan dulu, Oh, One, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next agenda is my lecture from Prof. Alfonso J. Rodriguez Morales from Institución Universitaria Vision de las America, Colombia. In this section, we provide the prize to be uh, distributed to the participants who have the best question, so don't miss this opportunity. In this section, also present with us Prof. Dr. Aguswan Dono, MPH Dr. PH, who, who will uh, guide the discussion in this section. Okay, let me read this CV. He is a professor of public health epidemiology, 
professor of research in health policy and biomedic and senior technical officer uh, OHW University of Minnesota Twin City and now he is the in the home coordinator so it's education from faculty of medicine undip and for MPH degree school of public health university of hawaii at manua honolulu usa in 1983 and for the doctor ph degree from school of Public Health University of Hawaii at Manoa, Honolulu, USA in uh, 1986. And he has a lot of the work experience that had Karang Kober Health Center Bajar Negara Regency 1975 to 1981, acting head sub of traditional Medician, Director of Community Development, DG of Public Health Development, Ministry of Health, Indonesia, 1987 to 1999. And then the Director of Center of Health Service and Policy Research, National Institute of Health Research and Development, Surabaya, Ministry of Health, Republic Indonesia, 1995 to 2000, and Acting Director, Center of Nutrition Research, Bogor, 1999, and Secretary, National Institute of Health Research and Development, Jakarta, Magis Ministry of Health, in 2000 to 2004, and then the directors of Center of Disease Control Research and Development, uh, National Institute of Health Research and Development, Ministry of Health, uh, in 20, 2004 to 2006. And last is the senior researchers, National Institute of Health Research and Development, Jakarta in 1989 to 2014. So, save, uh, to save time, let's welcome Prof. Dr. Agus Wandono, MPH, Dr. PH. Time is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Can uh, uh, you hear my voice? It's clear. Hello, Mbak. Yes. My voice is clear. Hello. Yes, oh. Can you hear yes, my? Sir. Okay. Uh, good morning to all participants, students, uh, colleagues, and uh, and good evening to distinguished uh, Professor uh, Alfonso Javier Rodriguez uh, Morales, and welcome to the activity of the visiting professor lecture concerning the new challenges for controlling arbovirosis and other zoonosis disease. Uh, in about next uh, duration of uh, two, three hours, I will accompany Dr. Uh, Professor Alfonso Javier Rodriguez Morales in this important event as the moderator uh, of, the, of uh, the visiting professor lecture. However, before I deliver the screen uh, to the Professor Morales, allow me to share a few minutes some introduction to all participants about the lecture and also to read Professor Morales' curriculum vitae. As we know that we are still in the recovery stage of the COVID-19 pandemic. And several weeks ago, we uh, heard from the declaration of from the WSODG about the monkeypox as the public health emerging international concern. Also, man, many public health experts warn us about so many threats of the zoonotic disease to human beings in the world, including Indonesia, that may be stimulating the next pandemic. Uh, those experts 
state that Indonesia is one of the country that is vulnerable to zoonotic disease, even as a uh, as a hotspot for the occurrence of the zoonotic pandemic. Most of the zoonotic risk factors in the world of animals, human, and their ecosystem are found in Indonesia. And uh, they are facilitating the occurrence and the spread of the zoonosis. Although we must be grateful that until now, Indonesia has not become the, a hotspot of the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, for example, like the COVID-19, uh, is very much uh, uh, felt in Indonesia. The tendency of the zoonosis to cause pandemic or public health emerging international concern rem remain a serious threat to the people of Indonesia. There are, there are more than hundreds of microorganisms that are ready to attack the human, and most of them are zoonosis. Uh, Arbuferosis and generally are a spillover of transferring by the factors from the wild animal to livestock and to human. The joint tripartite. FAO, OIE, WSO, and the UNEP uh, in the One Health High Level Expert Panel 2021 provide a modif modified operational definition of One Health, which is an integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainab sustainably balance and optimize the health of the people, animal, and ecosystem. Uh, this approach has been recognized as one of the powerful approach to solve the problems of coordination, uh, collaboration, and communication among human health, animal health sector, and their ecosystem during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 and others. Uh, the One Health approach, uh, uh, zoonosis, and also arbovirosis, and also the antimicrobial resistance are very challenging and important topic so that the G20 meeting that will be conducted in Bali next month has prioritized these three topics to be the main topics in this prestigious and important meeting. So it is very important for students in health subject mastering this concept and application. This lecture hopefully can be able to improve student abilities in applying the principle of One Health and student ability to work together across sector and to detect, to prevent, and to respond to the emerging infectious disease and also the arbovirosis problem. It is because after the student graduated, there will be the health officer, director, maybe the other important position in Ministry of Health in uh, provincial health office, district health office, and others. Although one health approach has been recognized as the good approach to solve the coordination, collaboration, and communication of the complex health problem, but in the application of this approach is not easy, and it faces some uh, difficulties and challenges. Therefore, this lecture theme is on the right track in uh, preparing the student, the next uh, health work, workforce, work, uh, workforce to work intersectorally with uh, one health approach, especially in detect, prevent, respond to emerging infectious disease and arbovirosis. Mm -hmm. Also, the organizing committee has been significantly appropriate to us, uh, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez Morales, as the guest lecturer in this event. Thank you to Dr. Morales for your willingness to provide the lecture concerning the new challenges for controlling arbovirosis and other zoonotic disease. Now, allow me to read uh, uh, his uh, great uh, CV. Professor Dr. Alfonso Javier Rodriguez Morales is an expert in tropical and emerging particularly in zoonotic and vector-borne disease, especially arboviral diseases. 
including COVID-19 and monkeypox. He is the president of a publication and research committee of the Pan-American Infectious Disease Association, API, as well as the president of the Colombian Association of Infectious Disease, ACIN, and he is the member of the Committee on the Tropical Medicine, Zoonosis, Travel Medicine of the ACIN. He is also the Vice President of the Latin American Society for Travel Medicine, uh, SLAMV, and a member of the Council of the International Society for the Infectious Disease, I see. Since 2014, he has been recognized as the Senior Researcher Ministry of Science and Columbia, of Columbia. He is Professor of the Faculty of Medicine uh, of the Fonda Foundation Universitaria Auton Autonoma de las Americas in Pereira, uh, Risaralda, Colombia. He is the external professor, uh, master in research uh, of tropical medicine and international health, University uh, de Barcelona in Spain. He is also professor of the master, of master program in clinical epidemiology and biostatistic, uh, Universidad uh, Scientifica de Sur, Lima, uh, Peru. He has been uh, awarded uh, in 2021 with the Raul Isturiz uh, Award, Medal of the API. Also in 2021, awarded with the Jose uh, Felix Patino Asculapius Staff Medal of the Colombian Medical College due to uh, scientific contribution on the COVID-19 during the pandemic. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the journal Travel Medicine and Infectious Disease. His scop scop scopus, scopus index is very high, 50, and uh, uh, the, with the Google Scholar high index is for also very high, 72. Now the floor is yours, Professor Alfonso uh, Javier Rodriguez Morales. Please. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, warm welcome from you, Dr. Agus Wendano, uh, as well from Dr. Wee uh, Sutinincy, uh, as well from the, the Master Program of Epidemiology. The Victoria University in Indonesia. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's again uh, a pleasure to me be with you in this uh, in this session, and I will proceed to share my my slides in, in order to to start this session. Uh, I will share uh, later with you this uh, this first presentation that maybe not only the presentation, but also some articles that um, I, I will share with you uh, of interest uh, to, to try to, to share with you this experience uh, related to uh, our, our virus uh, and, and, and zoonosis, especially from our experience here in, 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 in Latin America. Uh, I only, uh, before I start, I only would like to declare some potential conflicts of, of interest and acknowledgements uh, regarding the uh, funding that I have received uh, for the research that I have, I have done uh, over the last few years related especially to arboviral diseases. Uh, and, and probably right now, the, the most important uh, conflict of interest, because I, in fact, I will mention it later, is about uh, that I am member of the panel related to the development of dengue virus vaccines of, uh, of Takeda since uh, last, last year. But when, when we talk about uh, arboviral diseases, especially, and, 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 and we try to, to separate in, in terms of uh, what is uh, on one side arboviral diseases and another uh, zoonotic diseases, we are not talking uh, to completely separate things because I would like to remember you that many of, uh, of the arboviral diseases, in fact, 
are also sonotic. And this is an aspect that we may discuss later, but it's important to remember. Um, uh, beginning, not just uh, uh, speaking about the vital diseases, but in general, Bactrim burn diseases. Uh, I would like to start with this publication we made a couple of years ago in, in 2020 with the WHO and TDR about the importance of the root of the problem we have with Bactrim burn diseases in terms of control precisely. And that we need urgently and is still a, a multi-sectorial approach to the prevention and control of vector-borne diseases. That is important to remember that vector-borne arbovital diseases, zoonotic diseases, and even in general terms, tropical diseases are not only health problems, but social problems, are multi-sectoral problems that involve not only the participation of the health sector requires more than that in order to control the origin, the causes, and the determinants of the diseases. Still, we're facing a big challenge regarding the burden of multiple vector burn diseases, not only vital, as I, I especially uh, I'm interested or, or, or also, but particularly other, for example, parasitic uh, diseases, such as in the case of malaria, or in fact, filariasis, that are still highly prevalent in the world, especially in Africa, but not only in Africa, Southeast Asia, and here in the case of Latin America. And these vector prone diseases, and in general also zoonotic diseases, and in general tropical diseases, are related to multiple determinants that we need to remember and we need to focus in order to intervene, in order to approach to which is not related uh, only to pathogen or vector related determinants, but the importance of the health system related determinants, economic and social determinants, and especially environmental and agroecological determinants. And uh, as was introduced by, by Dr. August very well, this places us in, 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 in another important uh, approach that we need to keep in mind that is the integration of environmental, animal, and human health, which is called in the context of one world, one health. And we need certainly the importance of this interconnection between these, these three uh, uh, situations uh, that are uh, particularly important for us. Not only the human health, it's important to consider the relevance of animal as well as environmental uh, uh, health, which is this integration between this human, animal, environmental, and one health. And, and obviously, this uh, implies that, in fact, we have to work under this umbrella, an umbrella that uh, integrates multiple uh, approaches, multiple disciplines, not only uh, obviously public health, epidemiology, infectious diseases, but at the same time, people dealing with environmental science, with veterinary medicine, as well many other uh, aspects that in fact right now in the context of climate change are quite important. And it is well known that this is highly relevant for vector borne diseases, especially arboviral diseases that are very important in Southeast Asia, for example, and this is part of the, the publication we made some years ago, the Lancet Infectious Diseases, regarding the major arboviral diseases caused by alpha viruses and flaviviruses, for example, in Southeast Asia, including uh, Ross River, Chikungunya, Parma Forest, but especially also in flaviviruses such as, such as uh, Zika, Dengue, Murray Valley encephalitis, Kunjing, a, a, a subtype of West Nile virus that is widely extended over the world, as well in the case of Japanese encephalitis. But not even in those endemic areas, and I will show you later, another important aspect is that in fact, outside those tropical endemic areas, such diseases can be imported, but even locally transmitted, even for example, in Europe, and many vector-borne diseases, including 
Crimea, Congo, hemorrhagic fever, cutaneous maniasis, dengue, tick-borne encephalitis, uh, West Nile fever, and tick-borne in infections in general. Just to mention, few examples are important. Here in Latin America, in fact, we have also some local arbovital diseases that are not uh, present outside in Latin America, which is the case, for example, of Mayaro, which is uh, from uh, Trinidad Tobago, uh, originally reported of the case uh, Oropuche, also from that island. But we have here also, for example, some uh, forms of uh, uh, encephalitis, especially a queen encephalitis, which include the Venezuelan fern, Eastern equine encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis, all of them that are alpha virus, including one important alpha virus that after 2014 was significantly important here in Latin America and was in the past in countries such as La Reunion in the Indian uh, uh, Ocean, in India and some other uh, neighbor uh, countries in Asia, which is the case of chikungunya. And um, with Flavi, we have Zika, we have Dengue, we have Brazil, St. Louis encephalitis, but also yellow fever that as you probably know, due to globalization, travel, migration, has been not only reported in Africa and in South America, but also with important cases that were reported in China some years ago. And in fact, for example, just to, to, to make the, the point, yellow fever is still one important disease, not only in endemic areas, but particularly in travelers, which uh, uh, precise uh, to still keeping an eye, and especially after the COVID-19 that affect negatively the um, coverage for multiple immunizations, including in fact, yellow fever in endemic areas, uh, they need to increase again the coverage again, yellow fever with a very safe and effective vaccine against this arbovirus. And this is important because right now, some countries, for example, here in Latin America, had uh, present recently the re-emergence of this arbovirus system, particularly has been the case of Venezuela, but also here in Latin America, Brazil and Peru, among other that are including endemic areas. But certainly we have, for example, in countries that are right now under a, 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 a profound social and economical crisis, the re-emergence not only of arboviral diseases, such as in the case of Venezuela, with yellow fever, but even other zoonotic diseases, such as in the case of the group of uh, South American hemorrhagic fevers. We have hemorrhagic fevers, for example, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Bolivia, and in Venezuela. In the uh, last year, 2022, we made this report in new microbes and new infections about this re-emergence of cases of this uh, uh, rodent borne disease, which is a, a very uh, pathogenic virus with a high case fatality rate, which is the Venezuelan hemorrhagic fever caused by the Guanarito virus. And certainly, as I mentioned, multiple, not only social, but environmental determinants are important. For example, uh, wildfires, burnings are important in make the pressure over not only arboviral diseases, but in, in this case, for example, to uh, different wild animals and very domestic animals. And for example, the case of rodent that are associated with multiple virus that are present here in Latin America as well, for example, in, in, in Asia, which is, for example, the case of hantavirus. We have obviously different types of hantaviruses uh, or, or as are now called orthohantaviruses, but also in addition in this area that are uh, with an uh, important presence of rodents in different areas, not only the case of hantaviruses that may produce not only pulmonary, but even as occur, for example, in Asia with uh, uh, some diseases with renal compromise, the possibility to observe so the, 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 the zoonotic uh, diseases that I mentioned is the group of the South American hemorrhagic fever. For, a, for example, we have the emergence uh, in the past uh, decade 
of a new hemorrhagic fever caused by a, a new mammarina virus, which is called Chaparic, which will use an hemorrhagic fever, for example, here in, Bol in Bolivia, associated with this rodent of the species of Calobis uh, callosum. Here, for example, in Colombia, where I live, this is common also. We have coronaviruses, we have uh, hantaviruses, and multiple studies have assessed the re-emergence of these diseases in association not only with social determinants, but also a climate change, which has a certain impact on zoonotic diseases. And it's interesting. For example, uh, monkeypox has been recently, as was mentioned by Dr. Agos, declared on July uh, 23 by WHO as a public health emergency of international concern. But in fact, other recent public health emergency of international concern have been declared uh, and are also zoonotic diseases. And SARS is zoonotic, swine flu or H1N1 uh, uh, influenza is uh, zoonotic, Ebola is zoonotic, Zika we know is, is zoonotic, SARS-CoV-2 is zoonotic. So if you see, Many of these have been zoonotic. Some of them, in some of them, uh, not only public health uh, emergencies of international con concern, but also pandemic. And we'll discuss, uh, we will discuss some of them later. In 2018, I have been part of these uh, uh, committees that have been assessing this, for example, the list of low brain priority diseases in 2018. Also, many of them, including, in fact, uh, coronaviruses that were previously discussed uh, for their importance, including, for example, MERS, which is also zoonotic, especially associated with camels as its cause of this uh, uh, viral disease, uh, are uh, also zoonotic diseases. Rift Valley, Zika, uh, SARS, as I mentioned, Nipah, and Nipah viruses, uh, the case of even Lassa, Ebola, Crimean Congo, that is a tick uh, disease, among many other that were in fact included in this list. And in fact, the case of influenza specifically has been a matter of concern over the last few years. Not only H1 and N1, but different types of zoonotic influenza, not only from swine, but also avian influenza have been important. As you know that uh, there are multiple problems related to recombinant form of influenza in different animal hosts and the possibility to produce the spillover to human beings. And in fact, for example, avian influenza H5 in, in seeds in, in birds is highly important and has been revealed by different studies. But for example, H5 in H that last year was uh, until certain point, not considered a, a problem it's, uh, except for the case of birds, was reported in connection to human cases, for example, in, in Russia, and this may be a problem. Obviously, we are right now with the monkeypox outbreaks that has been declared a public health uh, emergency of international concern. And, and right now, it, with this disease, it's not only the problem of the spillover. And this was an editorial when published in, in, in June this year, asking if it's possible that uh, a car with uh, COVID-19 that was uh, transmitted not only uh, between humans, but for example, to domestic animals, this possibility would be possible in the case of monkeypox. As you will see here, the arrow with the, the, the dash um, uh, points that uh, was interrelated, the possibility the, the domestic animals would be also Cost for monkeypox has been in part recently answered. This publication in Lancet in August demonstrates the possibility that dogs may be infected by monkeypox, as was demonstrated from this HAB Serra Discordam uh, couple in Paris, France. And certainly, other reports are now coming out. And this is important and has the implication for research and to understand how important would be that in the near future for that possibility. But certainly monkeypox is, a, is a, an ongoing problem 
that we are right now uh, studying and understand if this will be a, a more uh, significant problem. It has been a question, it would be a certain point of pandemic right now. I don't believe that, but it has been also important the, the comparison with the lessons that we uh, learn from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And certainly we are facing multiple factors in order to understand the prevention of the next pandemic zoonosis. The different stages, as we, for example, proposed in Lancet by the Stephen Morser and colleagues uh, more than a decade ago, and the problems to understand the pre-emergence environments, the wildlife, the livestock, and, and, and for example, certain animals that are good host for multiple virus and general uh, emerging and emerging pathogens, and the possibility to the contact and the expansion of the wildlife human being interface, which has been, for example, clearly demonstrated, for example, during outbreaks of Nipah in Asia or uh, for Ebola in, 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 in Africa. But additional, the problems related, as in the case of COVID-19, the problem with SARS, with HIV, and right now, even with monkeypox of international travel uh, train. Certainly, and now focusing, for example, in the life cycles, for example, of arboviral diseases. We need to understand that, in fact, certain diseases may have different cycles. And this is the case, for example, of arboviruses that may have some of them very good, very well established wild life cycles, which, for example, happens with yellow fever but others that were in farms, animals, livestock, horses, uh, uh, and other animals involved. But recently, with the case of uh, the uh, outbreaks of Zika, that in fact Zika was declared in 2016 a public health emergency of international concern, other ways of transmissions in addition to the vector born was also important, in fact, Human-to-human -human transmission, especially by sets, but also mother-to-child transmission was also demonstrated. And in fact, today we know that many other arboviruses, not only Zika, but chikungunya, yellow fever, even Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever can be detected, viruses, viruses that can be detected, for example, in semen and other sexual fluids. So, there are multiple arboviruses causing problems in different ways. For example, here in the Americas, as I mentioned, we have a lot of different equine encephalitis that still are widely distributed in the continent. And some of them, in fact, have been moving. For example, West Nile virus now is not a problem only in the United States or North America, but right now it's distributed in different countries in Latin America where has been the problem. For the last few years, significant epidemics of chikungunya have been reported, obviously in Asia, in Africa, especially in, in La Reunion, Iceland, in, in 2005, 2006, was important to understand the clinical epidemiology of this disease, not only in the acute stage, but especially and additionally in the chronic consequence. But here in Latin America, after December 2013, was also a very important with the report of imported cases, but later of a, a autochthonous transmission, and as we also discussed in Lancet infectious diseases in 2015, that was a year that was key for that because um, uh, not only outbreaks in different Iceland, but later in multiple countries, for example, here in the America in the Americas uh, were uh, reported. Even later, another arboviruses very important, not only uh, for uh, the rheumatic consequences of the disease, but uh, for a wide range of uh, birth defects that were, uh, were associated with, in the case of Zika, that Zika were reported initially, uh, initially in Africa, later especially in, in the Pacific, 
But here in Latin America, after 2015, were reported in Brazil and later in many countries by vector-borne uh, transmission. But as I mentioned, imported cases to the United States, imported cases to Europe, and sexual transmission to Zika was important. Zika epidemic was associated with the microcephaly, the Zika congenital syndrome that was associated with multiple birth defects, not only in the central nervous system, but in many other organs. Uh, and also this epidemic was also associated with epidemics of Guillain-Barré syndrome. It's interesting that in many countries here in Latin America, and this is the, the epidemiological trend in the, the weirdly uh, report uh, uh, cases um, for these arboviruses, is that uh, we have the overlap of different arboviral diseases, which was also associated with even the possibility, not only with problem in diagnosis, but even with co-infections. We have a lot of co-infections between dengue chikungunya, dengue zika, zika chikungunya. And this was reported in different countries and different areas during the epidemic, which was also important later because it is still unclear what happened with certain phenomena of uh, antibody dependent enhancement between especially flaviviruses, such as what happened with between the serotypes of dengue. It's not clear if it's occurring or not yet after dengue with Zika or with Zika after dengue. But in some countries, largely affected by dengue epidemics and Zika epidemic, for example, in 2019, present a high proportion of dengue with severe presentation, severe dengue, according to the uh, WHO classification. The case, the mic is um, For example, that was the case of Honduras with a third of the cases presented with severe dengue. Hello, transfer to BSB, bisa so when is he speaking, uh, please uh, you may close your mic. It's, there are mm, number, a significant number of participants right now. It's difficult to uh, identify. But I continue. So that uh, was an important matter to, during the dengue uh, epidemic, for example, uh, here in, in, in Latin America. But and another important thing is that, for example, chikungunya and Zika were new arboviral diseases. Many people here believe that these were about to produce just epidemics, and after that, they will disappear. And that, that was not true. These arboviral diseases arrive and have all the condition to stay. Right now, we are not in the epidemics of chikungunya or Zika, but still, we have, after this year, the report of chikungunya as well as Zika cases. And in fact, even during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, 2021, we have obviously cases of dengue, we have a chikungunya, we have Zika reported in the region of the Americas. And in fact, all of them have been significantly circulating, not only in the past years, but even right now. We have chikungunya. We have Zika. I'm sorry, but again, someone he has been open the mic, and we have some whiskey. Whiskey, I will mute you. Whiskey, Amelia, I am trying to mute, but I can. I don't know if the the host or moderator may mute. And it might uh, be open. So I continue. Um, and then we have pre presented, especially for example, in certain islands, the Caribbean high uh, incident rates, for example, for dengue, as well as uh, dengue with severe presentation. And this has been important in the proportion, for example, of severe uh, dengue for certain areas. And in fact, 
we have right now the circulation again of all the dengue syrup types, especially dengue one, dengue two, dengue two, which is uh, has been especially related with a higher risk for severe dengue, but also dengue three and dengue four. In countries, for example, such as Colombia, we had, uh, for example, periods where uh, where we were in, in, in epidemics, and this has been important in, in certain areas uh, under the surveillance over uh, this year. And why is happening this? This is happening again, because for these arboviral diseases, what we have are eco-epidemiological conditions that are prone for the appearance of this disease. But this is not only in these tropical areas. Right now, under the climate change, vectors such as Aedes albopictus, are quite important even in Europe. As you see, for example, what happened over the last few years in certain countries in, in, in the European continent is that uh, outbreaks with autochthonous transmission have occurred, for example, for chikungunya in Italy with a risk under the, the climate change and warming, global warming scenarios to increase these possibilities. These are the models predicting that, but in fact, other countries, for example, what happened with uh, uh, chikungunya also in the south of France have been related also to climate change, to the presence of Aedes albopictus. In fact, Aedes albopictus has been uh, detected even in the north, in Paris, fortunately, without a uh, transmission of any arboviral diseases, but the vector has been detected and this was under summer, under climate change scenario. But even in France, Zika has been reported in the bar department, uh, has been reported in Lyon, in the south of France, in Marsilla, and even in Spain, in Europe, with a, a autochthonous transmission not only of Zika, but as has been reported some years ago, of dengue. In Spain, have been also reported in Chikungunya, in the case of Valencia, in Portugal, and in many other areas. It's interesting this because if you see right now, for example, some studies such as this in the Journal of Vector Ecology, the climate change is now associated with a high distribution, not only albo of albopictus, but if you see here, the points uh, in green are uh, places where you have it is albopictus plus, it is ejectile, but also, if you see the points in uh, orange, you will see that there is a distribution, an important distribution of Aedes uh, aegypti, for example, in different counties, uh, in different areas of the state of Florida in the United States. And this is important and right now. In fact, here in Latin America, especially in the Caribbean, right now we have also a, a third a vector, which is a, the Aedes vitatus, which is right now the third vector in addition to it is a Jeptai, it is a albopictum that is distributed. And this is the reason, for example, in the past in the United States, in Miami, they had autochthonous transmission of Zika, which occurred in, in, in precisely in the urban area, as you will see here, as was reported in the counties of Dade and Broward just in the centric uh, area of Miami. Not only, for example, here in tropical countries in Latin America, also this Asia, obviously here with our eco-epidemiological conditions and the presence of the vectors, uh, there is a significant association with the transmission and the incidence of this disease, which in some areas, as we have been reported, uh, is important not only during the epidemics, but for example, here in Colombia, in this uh, study that we have uh, published uh, some uh, months ago at the International Journal of Infectious Diseases, we have a high set of prevalence, for example, in high-risk populations, such as is the case of pregnant women, for dengue, 83%, for Zika, 86%, or even for chikungunya, 29%, as has been uh, assessed with uh, a PRNG. And in fact, even among those 
that I, there are seropositive for chikungunya. In fact, 96% at the same time seropositive for dengue. So we have right now to deal with the problem with co-infection. And again, when we are talking about arboviruses, arboviruses we're not talking just about one, but multiple arboviruses that may distribute and may change from different ecological and geographical areas. For example, yeah, we have in Asia a Japanese encephalitis, but this maybe in the future would be present, for example, even here in Latin America due to migration, due to uh, the vectors that are present. But uh, even we have to remember yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, Zika. But here in Latin America, we have Mayaro, we have Rapuche. For example, in Africa, we have John John. But we have many other obscure viruses, as some people would like to call them, such as is the case, for example, interesting, Kusutu, Simbis, that were in the past endemic just in Africa. You may find it, you may find them uh, right now, for example, in Europe. Kusutu and Simbis are present, for example, for example, in Europe. And many other are important to consider uh, for those possibilities for uh, that kind of migration, uh, the possibility to have the host, because for example, these are zoonotic, and for example, Usutu simbis may affect, for example, different animal hosts. And this is important to consider. For example, we have a Mayar, which is endemic here in Latin America, but is highly uh, important from the zoonotic point of view. Multiple mammals are susceptible to Mayar. This is also important for other alpha viruses, such as in the case of, a case of chikungunya and even John John. In the case of John John, John John, John, John uh, is endemic in Africa. You have uh, multiple countries, especially in, in Central Africa, in West Africa, that have reported this virus, some of them with a, a low number, but others uh, with a, a, a more significant number of cases. This, again, remember us that we have multiple complex cycles that include, in fact, in zootic transmission between animals. This is not enough speaking about arboviral zoonotic diseases. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this scenario was even complex. Everybody knows uh, today and remember the origins of COVID-19, its uh, apparent origin in China, in fact, associated initially with this uh, uh, Wuhan seafood well said market in, in, in Wuhan, but uh, that this, in fact, is uh, again zoonotic and was distributed highly across the world, especially because of the human human transmission and the respiratory uh, uh, transmission. And this uh, has been important, uh, for example, in North America, as was obviously here also in Latin America, as in many regions of the world, and uh, especially due to migration, important cases in, in Latin America, for example, especially from Italy. And uh, some months later, we had a lot of cases here in the region of Latin America due to, due to that migration with different impacts related to the health system conditions in our uh, countries. For example, I mentioned before the crisis in Venezuela that right now has led that Venezuela is even above Syria in terms of uh, uh, migration, forced migration and refugees right now uh, from Venezuela to multiple countries in Latin America and even uh, abroad. And with COVID-19, as I mentioned, COVID-19 has a zoonotic origin, but at the same time, as I mentioned before also, can be, can be transmitted to different animals uh, from humans. That was the case of different canines, um, felines, cats, ferrets, dogs, tiger. And the question if this was possible to transmit from these animals again to the human. And there were a lot of studies uh, regarding the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 
among these animals that were studied during the pandemic. And again, the reinforcement of the concept of One Health in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic because of these uh, possibilities. And uh, again, not only to remember that SARS-CoV-2 is zoonotic, but in general, coronaviruses. And that in fact, the next pandemic and the next epidemic will be also associated with a new coronavirus. That's it's another important thing we have to remember, especially in this possibility of interspecies transmission, a new spillover to humans, and uh, the need to uh, perform studies of the microbiome and especially of coronaviruses, of, for example, chiropterans, uh, different species of bats and other wild animals, not only for the case of coronaviruses, but coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses have been uh, very important as uh, was the case of SARS-CoV-2, that in the case of Latin America, impact significantly, for example, in countries such as Brazil, but we are also in Colombia, and not only by the original virus, but obviously the well-known variants of concern that were affecting different countries in the world. This context was also related to the context of arboviruses because as I mentioned, multiple countries here have been, for example, highly endemic and epidemic. And one of the problems that was highlighted to the, uh, this during the COVID-19 pandemic was the possibility of co-epidemics, but even co-infection. We were concerned, for example, in April 2020, about the possibility that COVID-19 produced severe disease, dengue may produce severe disease. And what happened with our capability from the health system, for example, to deal with patients at ICU and intensive care units because of this uh, situation with COVID-19 and simultaneously uh, epidemics of dengue. And this has been not only in Latin America, this is a paper that we published a few months ago with uh, our colleagues uh, from Bangladesh. And this was also a problem because of this epidemic of COVID and dengue, for example, in, in Bangladesh, which as we discussed in, in this Cambridge uh, journal, disaster medicine and public health preparedness, in fact, would be considered a double blow for a novel burden a healthcare system. And this happened in many places over the world where dengue and COVID were overlapping epidemics. Here in, in, in Latin America, Colombia, and many other countries uh, present and challenge this situation also with this possibility the possibility of co-infections. During the first year, we have over 1,300 cases of co-infection between dengue and COVID-19, and this is still increasing. And uh, for the last year, we have over 5,000 cases uh, of co-infection between dengue and COVID-19. This has been important even during this year that still we have uh, with a decrease, fortunately, of COVID-19, still uh, a stable number of cases of dengue. We have a report of co-infection between dengue and COVID-19 in different areas of our country. And this was reported, for example, uh, also in Brazil, also in Peru, this uh, situation between the overlapping of COVID-19, uh, dengue, uh, COVID-19 and dengue. But in fact, the first case of that was officially reported of the Journal of Travel Medicine during July 2020 in the island of Mayotte, a French territory that in fact was followed by a second case, very close geographically speaking, in the La Reunion Island some weeks later in August 2020, published at the PLOS Neglected Tropical Disease. And this was, uh, these were uh, the first cases of uh, co-infection between dengue and, and COVID-19 and were uh, important because uh, this was suspected. And later in other endemic areas, for example, here in Latin America, in Argentina, but also in the Caribbean islands, such as uh, this case 
in Guadalupe and here in Colombia, also we have those cases. And you will see if we call with pulmonary compromise, a rush, uh, other overlapping clinical manifestation between both diseases. Here, other reports in Colombia of cases initially between these co-infections, some cases that present uh, initially considered was COVID, others that initially present considered was dengue. But what's important that some countries start to uh, differentiate clinically, but also in laboratory terms, for example, in some studies, trying to understand which were the significant difference in laboratory test values between COVID-19 and dengue. This was a study uh, uh, performed here in Colombia showing that, for example, in this differentiation between COVID and dengue, for example, uh, the leukocyte count, the neutrophil count, the NLR, the platelets count, and transaminates were important because marked significant differences between COVID-19 and dengue. And in fact, it's important to mention that uh, in Argentina, was published by my, my friend, uh, Dr. Martin Strzelski, the first series uh, of uh, a co-infection, a number of 13 cases, but fortunately, none of them presenting with severe disease, none of them obviously presenting with a, a fatal outcome. This was similar to what's reported in Brazil, 30 cases, no severe disease, no fatal outcomes during the period that the, this was assessed. But here in Latin America, in this report we made with our colleagues uh, in Peru, uh, in fact, we had still the largest uh, study of uh, co-infection, 50 uh, uh, patients that present COVID-19 and dengue. As you will see here, 28% of them, 40 from 50, still we have to understand this carefully, uh, present a, a fatal outcome associated in part with the comorbidities, which are not only important for COVID-19 as a risk factor for severe disease, but also are important or would be important for the case of dengue. And uh, some of them obviously classified, for example, of severe dengue, but others uh, as severe COVID-19. And in fact, other fatal outcome cases have been reported later. For example, this case uh, from India that was reported in, in a teenager uh, that present with intermittent uh, episodes of fever with chills that were followed with vomiting and or nasal bleeding. And this case, unfortunately, end with a leukoencephalopathy, a, a acute hemorrhagic leukoencephalopathy associated with the dengue uh, and COVID-19 co-infection. This girl developed an uncle herniation and unfortunately she died. Probably other cases have occurred and this is served our uh, studies. It's important to think, to think not only in the differential diagnosis in endemic area uh, related with COVID and dengue and other arboviral diseases, but uh, it's important to consider the possibility of co-infection. I would like also to highlight this, which is the, the, the fact that certainly in COVID-19, we are clear and during the pandemic was evident that comorbidities such as hypertension, obesity, diabetes were important related to those risk factor for uh, the development of severe disease. But in 2018, this systematic review by the Padawi highlight this for dengue and West Nile virus. The importance, for example, of high blood pressure, asthma, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, as a risk factor also for dengue and especially severe dengue. This is important to remember. And when we discuss about co-infection, we need to think on this. And in fact, it's interesting because uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, few years with the COVID-19 pandemic, also these studies trying to assess uh, pathophysiological similarities 
and related routes, including plasma leakage, chromocytopenia, and coagulopathy are important in COVID-19 as well in dengue. And in fact, uh, multiple uh, immunological aspects are important, including, for example, cytokines that are shared or related in these uh, co-infections cases. And in fact, some of them may uh, uh, serve as co-infection biomarkers, such as TNF, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, uh, the, the uh, C reactive protein, among other uh, biomarkers that will be important in SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, and then get a co-infection as has been reported. In addition, obviously, to the overlap in clinical uh, findings in this patient. Recently, this systematic review, uh, the review of, uh, uh, of medical virology, show uh, also the countries that have reported the situation and a systematic review that was published last year also include some additional cases related uh, to fatal outcomes associated with shock, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and even uh, multiple uh, organ uh, failure among others. During this situation uh, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, also transmission of dengue, for example, in Southeast Asia and Latin America is supposed to have been affected. In some way, positively, as you will see here in the blue squares, a supposed reduction in the number of cases of dengue due to the lockdowns, for example, for COVID-19. But this was not the case, for example, in Laos, in Ecuador, and especially here in Peru, but also, as you will see here in Singapore, not for every country. And this is important assessment if each country should assess regarding these impacts related to this. In most countries, in most countries, the COVID-19 related disruption led to historically low dengue incidence, but this was not the case in all the countries. For example, in, in China, the, this uh, reduced dengue spread, for example, in the Jinan province, but do not reduce the establish of, of break as uh, was reported uh, in that paper uh, in emerging microbes. But here in the Journal of Medical Virology, we demonstrate that uh, the epidemiology of dengue in Peru was negatively affected during the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, uh, at uh, different regions and nationwide, there was a significant increase in the, uh, at the incident rates in different areas of the country. As you will see here, pre-COVID and during the COVID-19, with this increase in, in more than three times uh, of the uh, incident rates. In fact, as I mentioned, COVID-19 and dengue may be a deadly duo, as obviously it may occur uh, even uh, sometimes more than two uh, co-infections co with COVID-19, all the co-infections whether were reported, for example, with HIV, tuberculosis, but in fact, the, the, the topic of co-infections here in Latin America have been addressed uh, by us uh, in the past during the uh, arboviral diseases epidemics due to chikungunya and Zika. Uh, for example, this case is uh, an example of that, a case uh, in which uh, the patient uh, present with uh, leptospirosis, chikungunya, and dengue leading to uh, a fatal outcome. Sometimes people think in a differential diagnosis, but sometimes forget the possibility of co-infection. And in fact, we have proposed that here we uh, remember uh, this possibility from a mnemotechnic uh, way to remember. Something that, for example, in the Harrison of internal medicine has been proposed at the left Hangamuchi syndrome to try to remember leptospirosis, Hanta, uh, uh, Orientia, uh, Sutsugamuchi. Here in Latin America, we have proposed to remember these arboviruses with the Chik Deng Masika, to remember Chikungunya, to remember Dengue, Mayaro, and Zika as differential diagnosis. 
Uh, because this may occur, but also even not only with arboviruses, but the possibility of uh, co-infection, for example, with malaria. But this was uh, an interesting report from India, not only to uh, show the co-infections between SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS uh, and dengue, in this case, in pregnant women, but also with malaria. So it has been right now more reported uh, that in the past, uh, in the past was more important with the case of, of, of dengue, but right now it has been also reported with malaria. For example, during this context of the COVID-19 pandemic, in different countries, we developed evidence-based guidelines. And for the case of Colombia, we propose in the guidelines for COVID-19 to consider other differential diagnoses, including arboviruses such as dengue, but also malaria, leptospirosis, antivirus, among many others. From a, a general point of view, also has been discussed this kind of uh, report where COVID-19 pandemic uh, may mass dengue epidemics in certain countries and multiple publications have uh, addressed this and in even uh, discussed that the COVID pandemic should not jeopardize the dengue control because in fact, in other countries, uh, and for example, this was the case of India, the uh, uh, indicators related to uh, Tomological indices uh, show that, in fact, during uh, the pandemic, they increased. And in fact, there were, were, there were mixed results regarding the impact of lockdowns on dengue as were uh, reported in different countries. But in fact, bad condition, dengue, and COVID-19 may pro progress to severe forms. Patients may require uh, management at the ICU. There is concern about false positive serological tests and cross reactivity between dengue and SARS CoV 2 are reported not only in one initial paper on Lancet infectious diseases, but later. Still, we are trying to understand not only the frequency of such co infection, but the implications regarding risk factors and these common uh, pathophysiological routes between them. And obviously, these endemic epidemics pose a challenge for healthcare system. Here, for example, some reports showing this possibility of false positive serological results due to pro-reactivity in Indonesia, in Singapore, uh, in, uh, in Singapore, sorry, in, 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 in Brazil, in the United States, uh, have been uh, this reported, uh, for example, regarding this situation. This was a study uh, in Belgium, uh, as I seen, for example, with malaria, chisto, dengue, and this cross reactivity with uh, COVID-19 serological test. So it's important to consider this and to assess in each country regarding these possibilities. Here in Colombia, in addition to uh, dengue, also Zika was assessed regarding this, 20% of serological cross reactivity was found in a patient with the previous acute Zika and uh, the cross reactivity with COVID-19. For example, in Brazil, it's been also reported, for example, not only with dengue, but also with Zika. So uh, these arboviruses have been also, in terms of, so uh, a matter of concern during the uh, COVID-19, but also other arboviruses, which as I mentioned before, yellow fever, which is a vaccine preventable disease at the same time, such as in the case of other uh, uh, vaccine preventable diseases, such as measles and uh, meningococcal uh, disease. And some countries, such as was the case, for example, of Brazil, uh, suggest that the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to the failure of this country to meet the appropriate vaccination coverage goals. And this, for example, happened in Venezuela, as I mentioned, but also in Brazil, as was reported in this uh, study from this country and uh, the Pan American Health Organization. In uh, an editorial we published some months ago, also this was discussed because, for example, here in Colombia, 
as well in Ecuador, in Brazil. Unfortunately, the coverage for multiple immunizations, not only those for um, yellow fever, but for hepatitis, for polio, uh, and for many other rotavirus, pneumococcal diseases, decrease as a consequence of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. This is important to consider uh, uh, in, in the general context of uh, vaccine uh, preventable disease. Obviously, a, a new pathogen is circulating, as we also mentioned, and I would like, in order to go into the closing of this presentation, to uh, highlight uh, the importance of uh, monkeypox. Here, for example, in Latin America, we have been presenting a significant number of cases. And right now, countries such as Brazil and Colombia are under the top of the number of cases of monkeypox. Certainly, monkeypox may produce rash, but not every rash in countries where you have arboviruses will be exclusively monkeypox. And uh, there is an epidemi epidemiological overlapping differential diagnosis we have to consider with monkeypox, certainly. Monkeypox may produce rash, but it's important to uh, consider that especially vesicular papular rash is associated with monkeypox instead of the macular papular rash that is especially associated with Chica, uh, chikungunya, dengue, uh, mayaro, Zika, and also, also to consider the viruses, the important that recently have emerged with the case of a yellow fever. And we have also to consider the So a monkey is important, but this is limited compared to the large epidemics of uh, certain carboviruses that we have uh, not only in the past, for example, chikungunya zika, but uh, right now, we're, for example, with them. This again, uh, bring us uh, to my initial point, the problem of vector board diseases, zoonotic diseases, and the need for this multi-sectoral approach that include not only the control of the vectors, but the importance to go forward regarding the uh, uh, vaccination, at, uh, uh, for example, uh, with uh, vaccines for arboviral diseases. We have right now vaccines for tick-borne encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, and we have also dengue, uh, at least one vaccine from Sanofi, the Baxia, uh, with those limitations that everybody knows, that we may discuss the one, but right now there is also uh, the Takeda vaccine with a very interesting data from efficacy and safety, uh, not only in short, but even in moderate uh, follow-up of the uh, uh, studies that have been uh, precisely studied in, in, in Southeast Asia and Latin America, especially. And in fact, this year, this is a, a news from Takeda from August of this year. Takeda a vaccine, which is also a, a dengue tetravalent vaccine, a lip atenoid vaccine, was approved, in fact, in Indonesia for use regardless of, of prior dengue exposure. And, and this last comment is related to the fact that there are no significant differences between the efficacy uh, of this vaccine between seropositive and seronegative uh, 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 populations. And in fact, there are certain difference, but not too much regarding uh, the different uh, serotypes and uh, other variables that uh, you may discuss. So we need to, uh, to prepare. We need to prepare for the next serpoviral epidemics, not only here in Latin America, but abroad. We sometimes make the question, who can it be now? Can be the Butch, Mayar, West Nile, some encephalitis. Obviously, this depends in more importance of the geographical area we are, but we have to remember that we have a lot of emerging and emerging vector borne encephalitis diseases. Uh, as many we uh, precisely discussed uh, in this presentation, that unfortunately, Many of them affect especially 
the most vulnerable population. Here in Colombia, we have uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which was the uh, Nobel Prize of Literature. And uh, he says in Spanish, la muerte no llega con la vejez, sino con el individuo. Death does not come with old age with oblivion. And some of these tropical diseases, vector borne diseases, zoonotic diseases, are in fact neglected diseases. How many deaths due to tropical diseases can be avoided? How can investment in these neglected diseases significantly change the course of disease? Even in a macro vision, how could the socioeconomic condition of those affected by these diseases can be changed to avoid transmission or be the mortality? We must rescue tropical and emerging global diseases from oblivion. And the rescue begins with us. And to consider the importance of this to address them, to include many of them that in fact are, are not under the regular surveillance in the surveillance in order to prioritize, uh, to prioritize the importance of them and uh, to study. Especially because from this group of the sonotic and vector born will be the next emerging a tropical or emerging disease. We are, as we discussed also in this editorial, in focusing tropical disease, living on an edge. That edge is not this one, which is a real edge in, in a valley here in, in Colombia, uh, a very nice uh, place to visit the Chicamocha uh, Valley here in, in, in Colombia, uh, but the edge to uh, fall into a new epidemic caused by any uh, vector board or zoonotic disease. I would like to finish uh, to invite you to visit uh, our section of emerging tropical diseases and frontier tropical diseases, where I am the specialty chief editor. I would like uh, to acknowledge the participation of different uh, collaborators from our uh, Colombian network uh, of uh, research for Zika and uh, other robotic diseases our Latin American network of COVID-19 research. Uh, also uh, the contribution of the many members of the Columbia Association of Infectious Diseases uh, in, in many of these uh, studies. And I would like uh, to finish this presentation to invite you to visit Colombia. I know we are very far and you probably uh, consider that I have never been in, in Asia, but in fact, I, I have not yet the fortune to visit Indonesia, but I have been in India, I have been in Turkey, in Japan, uh, in Philippines, and other countries in, in Asia. I hope to, to have the opportunity in the future to visit uh, not only virtually, but uh, in presence in Indonesia. And at the same time, you are cordially invited to, uh, to visit in Colombia, these are pictures uh, here uh, from different areas, especially the Coffee Triangle area. Uh, one of the uh, archaeological sites, the lost city in the uh, uh, snow uh, mountains uh, of the north of the, of the country. And as the poet of uh, Pereira, Luciano Garcia Gomez said, in Pereira, there are no fragments. Uh, no foreigners, we are all Pereiras. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Gracias. And I am open to comments, uh, uh, questions, and, and, and discussion about uh, this presentation. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Morales, for uh, excellent uh, scientific evidence piece and very uh, inspiring, motivating, and challenging lecture. Yeah. Uh, big, big applause for you and uh, really appreciate for that one. Uh, I think it's now is the time for the asking question, clarification or comments from the student and the participant. Uh, and now I invite all the student to uh, raise hand or to write a, a question in the chat box. Or maybe the organizing committee has already collected compile and selected the question to the in, in the chat if yes please show up the uh, uh, three question the first three question and then after that uh, later on we'll be uh, continue with the other question 
So that the three question first, please. The OC, organizing committee. No Is question, there any question? Prof. Pardon? No, no question. Okay. No question oh. yet. Okay. So, uh, Professor Morales, if uh, because uh, waiting for the question from the student, I will ask you to uh, some some uh, a question related with the. Uh, 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 next uh, preparation because with the experience of the uh, arpovirosis and the condition of the arpovirosis now and the condition of the several uh, emerging infectious disease, what should we do for the very important uh, uh, two things that maybe we have to do for the uh, future to uh, prevent and to uh, uh, protect the uh, you know, the pandemic for the future, please. Well, there are many things that we may discuss in that, uh, in that direction. I think it's, it's important that the, with the well-known established, for example, arboviral and zoonotic diseases, we, we have to, to enhance the surveillance. It's important to check again the important surveillance. And in that direction, it's important uh, again to increase the, the capabilities, not only for clinical diagnosis, but also for laboratory diagnosis. Uh, in many countries in, in the world, uh, and this is the case of most of the countries here in Latin America, uh, a high proportion of cases of dengue, for example, are clinically diagnosed, but not laboratory diagnosis. That is a, okay. it's a problem, especially when you have overlapping of uh, right now of multiple arboviral diseases. So it is difficult, for example, to, 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 to consider that we will perform molecular diagnosis for all the cases, but we have to prioritize, uh, for example, uh, people with risk factor for molecular diagnosis. And that has been right now occurring in some countries in Latin America for dengue, for chikungunya, and Zika. But at the same time, it's also important to increase the availability of rapid diagnostic tests that uh, right now are increasing in, in better um, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, at the same time, I think it's also very important, not only for the well-established uh, known uh, arboviral and zoonotic disease, uh, uh, but for uh, unknown emerging diseases to increase our capabilities, not only for molecular diagnosis, but especially for genome sequencing and especially metagenomics. That is right now key for every country in the world in order to detect early any emerging disease that probably will not be diagnosed by conventional diagnostic tools, including not only serological, but even a molecular, a molecular diagnosis that are, 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 target, are targeted to, to a specific pathogen. So that is also important because well, but let's say that, that the case of SARS-CoV-2 or, or monkeypox, uh, for example, metagenomics and, and, and gene, uh, sequence, uh, genome sequencing have been very important, not only for uh, the diagnosis, but also to understand the change yeah. in the, in the uh, uh, genomic evolution of the pathogen. For example, in SARS-CoV-2, what uh, you know happened with the uh, variants of concern, and right now with monkeypox that is discussed uh, as we, by the way, present in the previous presentation to, with you in this space regarding, for example, of new clades of the monkeypox virus that is not only uh, probably uh, uh, today two clades, but, but three clades as has been reported uh, recently in different countries with different lineage. So build up those, uh, those capacities for diagnosis is key for us to early detect and obviously uh, to uh, manage uh, epidemics uh, caused by uh, emerging pathogens, in, in addition to multiple lessons that were learned the, the, during the, the COVID pandemic regarding to the health system and the specific response to the pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with you and really important that, that we have to have the very good uh, uh, mm -hmm. laboratorium capacity capacity uh, and also the you know the uh, 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 resources for the uh, to develop the, the laboratory 
The problem is uh, actually uh, we have a lot of laboratories and also I believe that uh, in your country. The problem is uh, uh, the laboratory seems that if we want to detect uh, the, the pathogen like the uh, infectious disease pathogen and uh, emerging infectious disease, we forget about the, uh, the biosecurity and uh, uh, biosafety of the laboratory. Yeah, something. It's not uh, really uh, our laboratory is not really uh, uh, in the in the in the in the form of uh, really carry out the biosecurity and biosafety uh, uh, procedure. How about in your country and how to uh, raise the uh, awareness of the you know the laboratory related with the biosecurity and biosafety? Well, that, that that's an important a very important point. In, in fact. When we, we start to build up a better capacity, this is not only include, for example, the technical capacity of the of the of the diagnostic tests, including molecular and, and, and genome sequencing, metagenomics, etc., but also the biosafety capacities in the laboratories. We need to increase that. We need to improve that. And for example, here during the the, the pandemic, it's important, for example, uh, to mention. The, the experience in the country. At the beginning of the pandemic, only one laboratory was with the capacity to perform molecular diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. Right now we have over 3000 laboratories over the country to perform molecular diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. But at the same time, initially only one laboratory was able to perform genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. Right now we have the network of 70 laboratories with capacities uh, to perform genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. And, and the good thing is right now, this is not only used for SARS-CoV-2, but for other pathogens, including the case of monkeypox. Uh, obviously this was uh, supported by funding by the government, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Science, in order to increase the preparation, training of personnel, but also the biosafety conditions, because obviously we need to improve that. Uh, at the same time, I think that COVID-19 uh, was important for lessons that were learned regarding the importance of the use, the correct use of personal protection equipment. That was not only uh, obviously for, for healthcare uh, workers, but also in general, but lab laboratory, uh, personnel, uh, and this is uh, also important to deal with these uh, pathogens that sometimes will require even uh, high levels of uh, biosafety. So that is very important, and we need also to build up that, and at the same time to train people properly to deal yeah, with this right. safety. Yeah, thank you very much. Really important because uh, according to the, our experience, uh, laboratory, if uh, laboratory doesn't really uh, carry out the uh, the bio bio risk uh, uh, protection and uh, bio safety and biosecurity. It will be will cause the problems because, for example, like the SARS uh, uh, the SARS problem in the in the in the past is caused by the problems in the laboratory because they do not really they didn't really uh, concern about the biosecurity and bio bio uh, uh, safety of the laboratory. It will cause a problem if not, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, is there, a, yeah, is there any uh, question from the uh, lecturer? Or from the, the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, if you have any comment. There is a question in, in the chat. Oh, okay. Let, let, let yes, me any see. question from Kaliste, Yeah. Okay, there's a question from the uh, Alisti, the student from the Magister of uh, uh, Master of Epidemiology. As the molecular diagnosis are expensive in some of the developing uh, nations, don't you see uh, don't you see it as a global challenge that should uh, uh, hinder the quick and effective uh, containments of the zoonotic disease or pandemics? 
Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think it's important that, uh, again, we, we, we have to refer to the situation with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, obviously, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, for example, there were countries without even one laboratory for molecular diagnosis. It, it, that was that uh, was happening, especially in countries in Africa. But that, I think it's important, uh, not only the experience here, for example, in North America, but also in, in, in Africa, regarding the importance of international collaboration. For example, in, in Africa, multiple countries submit or, or send samples for molecular diagnosis initially, for example, to South Africa. Here in Latin America, happen again, for example, multiple samples were sent to Brazil or were sent to the United States in order to perform molecular diagnosis in some countries without those capabilities. I think it's important to consider that the networks of, of laboratories in, in some continents are key to uh, uh, collaborate in that way. But at again, although the molecular diagnosis would be, would be considered expensive, uh, at the end it's not expensive if you consider the cost effectiveness of the, of the diagnosis, uh, especially when you are uh, dealing with the a, a, a beginning of a, 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 an epidemic. And I, I think it's important uh, to increase with national, but also international funding and collaboration to build up and improve that capabilities for molecular diagnosis and at the same time for uh, uh, genome sequencing. And at the end, if this is not possible in some specific country, uh, it's important to have the collaboration of international uh, laboratories that would collaborate not only with molecular diagnosis, but at the, at the same time with uh, genome sequencing. Yeah, uh, thank you. Another question is uh, come from Henry Harianto, the surveillance officer at both hospital and primary health care center, uh, lack of uh, lack the strengthening of the accurately reporting at the management level and uh, across a sector. How can we strengthen the surveillance, uh, especially for the uh, for the detection and diagnosis? Very good question. Uh, uh, again, in addition to what we already mentioned. I think it's key education, training. This is one of the most important things. We need to train people at primary care. We train to people primary care, priority disease. Obviously, for example, if you are in an endemic country of dengue, you need all your primary care centers, all your hospitals that will attend people potentially with dengue trained to identify correctly the disease, okay. the importance okay. of accurate and timely Can you mute, mute the uh, participant, please? Mute the, 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 the your... Okay, bro, okay, bro. Now, uh, sorry, and, it's sorry. and it's important to train people uh, also to identify correctly and timely reporting the cases. Obviously, to have uh, the more accurate report for surveillance. Uh, at the same time, this is coupled with the capabilities, not only for the clinical uh, diagnosis and the epidemiological surveillance, but also, as we mentioned before, to increase the proportion of laboratory confirmed uh, uh, cases by molecular, but also the possibilities, not only for dengue or for arboviral, but for many other zoonotic and tropical diseases with, uh, uh, for example, serological tools that would be possible to use, for example, with rapid tests that right now are available. Yeah, thank you. This is another question from the uh, our student from, I think from Uganda. Yeah, uh, in the past uh, month, the minister, the Ministry of Health in Uganda, declared uh, an outbreak of the Ebola virus. 
at least 64 uh, people in Uganda have been uh, uh, or are suspected of having uh, been infected with a, a rare species of the uh, Ebola virus, for which uh, no vaccine and no treatment are available. Uh, about uh, 30 people have died. Maybe you have a comment for this. Yeah. Well, it, it's, in, it's interesting because uh, regarding uh, Ebola, um, after the 2014 epidemic, uh, there was a, a, a significant change uh, regarding the perception of the risk of Ebola outside Africa. And this led uh, to more increased efforts, uh, still not the ideal, but increased the importance uh, regarding, regarding the, uh, the efforts related to research, including the vaccine development. And, and, and in fact, vaccine is in a, a very advanced stage that has been passed by phase three trials with a, a significant uh, efficacy that is right now uh, in, 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 a, in a very good stage. And in fact, uh, not only in Uganda, but in other countries where the uh, historically uh, epidemics of, of Ebola that have been uh, applied, uh, such as, for example, Sierra Leone, uh, in which this right now is trying to see the impact uh, in terms of public health. Nevertheless, again, uh, uh, for example, for uh, Ebola and uh, other uh, filoviruses, it's important to consider the importance to increase not only the clinical diagnosis and surveillance, but especially the uh, genome sequences, because uh, with genome sequencing, you will detect if you have a new or not a, a new uh, species of uh, Ebola virus. This is important. Uh, obviously, uh, at the same time, uh, the, the proper early treatment uh, diagnosis and early treatment is key that has been highlighted in, in multiple studies in Africa for, for the case uh, of Ebola. Uh, while we were uh, answering, part of the question was also included uh, I don't know, Dr. Argos, if you want to read it. Uh, yeah, I think it's related with the qu that question. Uh, uh, the Ministry of Health in my country, Somalia, start prepare uh, action to prevent the outbreak uh, in Somalia related with the Uganda uh, cases, yeah? For the uh, reasons that a lot of uh, passenger travel from uh, and to Uganda daily, yeah? Uh, therefore, uh, how proven the outbreak of this uh, disease? I think it's uh, just uh, uh, how to, to prevent yeah, the, the, the travel from the uh, uh, spillover because of the uh, travel from, from, from Uganda to Somalia. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that this, this, this comment and the question brought to us two important aspects. The first, is, is, is to remember that we need, in order to, to, to confirm or to prove an outbreak, we need obviously to establish a molecular diagnosis. Right now for infectious diseases, molecular diagnosis is key, not even for Ebola, but for any, any outbreak. For example, a few weeks ago, there was a undiagnosed a, a outbreak of pneumonia in Argentina that was molecular confirmed that was due to Legionella for example, and that was because of molecular diagnosis for uh, genome sequencing and, and, and metagenomics. <clears throat> in the case of, of, of an outbreak, especially considered Ebola, this is key. Obviously, in the context of, of we mentioned biosafety, for the, the taking of the sample, et cetera. And the other point that is important when we are discussing emerging and emerging uh, diseases, and I mentioned in my presentation, is the aspect related to travel, international travel. We need to focus also as countries in the sentinel uh, surveillance at uh, airports, for example, at international borders, because you may have the possibility to receive passengers, uh, people that are presenting different conditions. So uh, this, is, this has a lot of conditions 
during uh, and, and, and discussions during COVID-19 that was uh, deployed. Uh, for example, the, the assessment of temperature, questionnaires to assess, to assess the, the general health, some things more effective than others, but in general terms, try to assess in certain ways, especially with questionnaires, the possibility that you uh, catch symptomatic people. And that is very important, but also to ask specifically to people where they have been and if they have sent certain symptoms during, for example, the last 21 days, which is important uh, in the case of uh, Ebola virus. For example, during the 2014 outbreak of Ebola in Africa that led to reported cases in countries outside Africa, such as Spain, uh, United Kingdom, Italy, and especially United States, also in other countries here, including Colombia and other countries in Latin America, led to health authorities to impose to migration officers, the airports, to ask specifically the people where they came from. And what happened if they came from a country with uh, an outbreak, for example, as I mentioned, Sierra Leone, uh, with fever during the last 21 days. So it is also important to consider the importance of travelers and to try to perform certain surveillance among them. That has been also important during COVID-19, but even for Ebola, other emerging and re-emerging conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody raise a hand. Maika Ayub, you can just directly, uh, 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 you know, us. Hello. Hello. Hello, somebody raise your hand. No? That's what I think this is a Oh, it's in the chat. Oh, no, 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 it's not. If you have uh, raised the hand, just directly ask to Professor Morales. Oh, it is unmute. Uh, please uh, uh, unmute. Uh, uh, the OC, please unmute. The yes. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, thank you so so. Much. Thank you so, so much, Professor, for this opportunity to share with us. I'm Maiga Ayub, and I'm from Uganda. Professor, I have a question that uh, um, um, we are just realizing that in Africa, and generally, uh, I can give an example of Uganda, the surveillance systems usually wake up when there is probably uh, an emanation of a disease. So, Professor, how do you really think we can improve that so that we can have early detection prevention of diseases? Sorry, may you repeat some, some parts of the of your question? We're really low. Yeah. I'm saying, Please. Professor, that uh, in Africa, and uh, most especially, let me give an example of Uganda, surveillance systems uh, wake up when there is an outbreak and that's when you feel like uh, that's when you hear things like they have tried to employ more uh, personnel they have tried to use um, getting more equipment and i'm realizing it is actually one of the determinants of uh, uh, uh that actually prevent early detection and uh, prevention so professor how do you think we can actually improve on such uh, a dilemma of uh, sleep of uh, of uh, surveillance systems which are asleep. Thank you. Well, it's, it's part related to what we already mentioned here. Well, in general terms, uh, at uh, any country, what we need in first, in first place is to increase uh, education. I think it's highly important to increase the education of the healthcare person. We have to train specifically and well people in the healthcare sector to deal with emerging and emerging diseases. This is, this is key in the first place. 
at the same time, and we didn't mention, but for many diseases, uh, would be also important to consider the important, probably most of them, uh, the education of the population in general, in order to identify and recognize the disease, when to go to the hospital, when to stay, when to consider uh, the, the severity and the risk of certain diseases, and in order to uh, understand what to do in the right moment. But I think it's, it's critical, the, 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 the healthcare sector uh, education, the first place to correctly identify diseases as we mentioned, but also at the same time, build up better capacities, not only for the clinical diagnosis, but at the same time for laboratory diagnosis. And sometimes obviously, this, this will not be able in, in, uh, in, in wide uh, availability countries, but the capacity to correctly take a sample, and for example, let's say in a rural area and, and to properly transfer to the capital city in order to uh, perform a, a diagnosis. I, I think those aspects are still key in order to improve our, our capacities uh, to perform better diagnosis and at the same uh, at the same time surveillance for emerging and, and emerging diseases in, in, in any country of the world, including countries in, in Africa. And in some countries, if it's not available, uh, the possibility to perform a molecular diagnosis, for example, uh, to collaborate with reference centers, for example, let's say in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg or Johannesburg, for example, or other cities where, where this is, is impossible and the collaboration, in fact, exists. Yeah, oh, thank you very much uh, for the question and excellent discussion because of the time limitation. And I know that uh, in uh, for, for Professor Morales, there is about, about midnight already. <laughs> so that, yeah, in fact, yeah. right now it's midnight. Now yeah, I am yeah. in the same day, day that you, here right yeah. now is three, two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. So uh, I will try to elaborate some important issue, but before that, I would like to get a, a, a opportunity to for Professor Morales to uh, to 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 give us a uh, short closing uh, 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 to give us a short closing statement and conclusion, please, Professor Morales. Well, um, I would like first uh, to thank uh, again for the, the opportunity and the invitation. It's, it's just been a, a pleasure to share this, this thing with you and some, some experience. Uh, and I, I would like to highlight the importance that certainly parvoviral and somatic diseases we still have. We need, again, to increase our research. We have to develop our own research in our own countries. We have to consider the importance of what is called South-South collaboration. For example, collaborations between uh, Indonesia and Colombia, for me, is that one. South-South collaboration, the importance of you because we share common problems uh, and, and we need obviously to address for the well uh, of our population. And uh, in that, Context of viral diseases and zoonotic diseases are quite important at the same time in, in Southeast Asia and here in, in Latin America. So I think this kind of spaces are, are important in the context, for example, of a, a master program of epidemiology or where epidemiologists need uh, to involve more, uh, not only uh, in, 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 in the general activities uh, of uh, the education programs, but specifically on those that are related, uh, for example, to uh, this kind of diseases, emerging and, and emerging diseases. And this is important uh, for the preparation and for the training of the epidemiologists that will, uh, will be working in endemic areas for, uh, for uh, arboviral and zoonotic uh, diseases. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, uh, very uh, nice your, your moderation, Dr. I was so well honored. Thank you very Welcome. much Welcome. For, for your kind participation. It has been a pleasure to share this space uh, also with you. Okay, thank you very much. 
let me try to some uh, to elaborate some important issue that uh, first the threat of the human natural disaster I call as the human natural disaster mainly do the zoonosis or maybe arbovirosis will increase in the future I call as the disease of tomorrow yeah, it's uh, proven by the COVID-19 and other uh, uh, requires uh, a joint effort. It's uh, required a joint effort intersectorally by the umbrella of One Health. Yeah. It is important to solve the complex uh, risk factor problem related to the human, animal, and uh, their ecosystem. Yeah. Some uh, endemic uh, arbovirosis and other uh, in emerging infectious disease such as the dengue, chikungunya, malaria, it's five uh, and one mentioned by Professor Morales and so on, uh, should be intensively controlled intersectorally. In some important cases such as the uh, Japanese municipalities, West Nile, Nipah, uh, etc., are uh, attacking the human nerve system, including the brain that uh, resulted fatality and disability. So that we have to be careful with this uh, kind of uh, 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 arbovirosis and uh, emerging infectious disease. I try to uh, conclude uh, maybe five strategy to enhance the implementation of the uh, One Health or integrated approach for uh, combating and prevent, 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 prevention of the zoonosis disease. The first one is sustain national and global funding yeah, for the One Health uh, prevention and preparedness. Number two is a uh, massively scale up the One Health surveillance across yeah, uh, key white wildlife, livestock, and human interface, and improve the, the the role and the capacity of the laboratory. Number three is in ident identify uh, create or strengthen the uh, coordination mechanism at the national and the sub-national level related with uh, how to combat with the uh, arbovirosis and emerging infectious disease. Number four is to develop and uh, expand the uh, interoperable, open and rapid uh, information system or data sharing mechanism across the sector. Yeah, I think. Uh, last, last one is the strengthen One Health uh, research network and uh, uh, workforce training uh, and uh, leverage the capacity of the university, NGO, and industry. For example, like the we, we already have the, the, the networking between the ASEAN country. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, we have the collaboration with the uh, African country, yeah. but not yet with the South American country. Maybe uh, your offer and uh, maybe uh, your uh, you know present will uh, start to uh, for us to have the collaboration between the uh, South Asian country, Southeast Asian country, and uh, uh, South American country, or to develop the networking, for especially for the capacity building, yeah, for the uh, 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 health worker, epidemiologists, and maybe carry out research together and exchange a, a lecturer and exchange student, something like that. Maybe it can be started by, uh, by the existence of uh, your present now. <laughs> I think that is my conclusion. And thank you very much one more, Professor Morales, for the very, very good uh, and excellent uh, lecture. And uh, we should give uh, one more applause to, all, uh, to, to, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good night. Have a sweet dream. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Good day for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so. Back to the. Uh, back to the. Uh, thank, you. We, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it's amazing our speaker and moderator, moderator today. Please give applause again. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is the lecture from Prof. Alfonso Javier Rodriguez, Rodriguez Morales. Thank you so much for your very, very good lecture. May all of us get the value and benefit from this lecture. 
And we also do not forget to express our gratitude to Prof. Dr. Agus Wandono, MPH, Dr. BH, who have great this session. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, before we close this agenda, this is an interesting announcement. We have got two participants with the best question. The two people are, yes, Mr. Handy Haryanto and Mr. Maiga Ayub. Congratulations. We congratulate the participant with the best question. Hopefully, hopefully this can be a new spirit and be a motivation for other participants to be more active. Okay. For our winner, we commit to committee will contact you for information on receiving prizes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, to all participants, for the documentation, we are going to have a photo session again with the speaker, moderator, and the head of the Epidemiology Master Study Program. And all participants, please on camera. The committee will take a photo. One. <laughs> One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Finally, we come to the end of this event. So to close this event, let's reciting Hamdalah. Alhamdulillah, alamin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your coming and your nice attention. Apologize if we are not perfect in the, in the event. And I ask the presenter, I'm sorry if there are mistakes in bringing this event. The last, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and see you next event. Thank you, Prof. Agus, Prof. Alfonso. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Agus. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.